everybody. Welcome to the Buna Church of Christ service and we trust that you are blessed as you share with us in this time of fellowship this morning. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come into your presence this way this morning as our, our church family to worship you and to praise you. We just pray for those people who are unable to attend with us this morning, part of our family, and we just pray that it will be a special blessing to them wherever they may be. Encourage them and draw them close in that relationship with you. So, Father, we just pray now for your continued guidance as we serve you in this way. Amen. I'd like to bring a reading to you this morning from Psalm 113. And it's a, a psalm that starts off, Praise the Lord, and it ends with, Praise the Lord as well. Very timely. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted above all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. And we are going, I invite you now to stand as we sing the song, We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. gathering together as a church family is a time of communion. As we reflect on Jesus with the disciples, the last supper that he shared with them, the key elements he had in that, uh, that supper. And the early church, as they gathered together, they had those same key elements that were there. A constant reminder to each one of them as they gathered of the sacrifice that Jesus had made for each one of them. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, you know, words which are very familiar to us because we just you know, can hear them over and over again, but I'd like to bring those to you again. 
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now they are simple words, but they are just so wonderful, so dramatic, aren't they? Whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Here's the reason for our being, our existence, our hope for the now and our hope for the future. And through his sacrifice on the cross where he took our sins, the sins of the whole world, the past, the present and the future, upon himself. And that has been dealt with. We have been restored in our relationship with the Lord. So in this time of communion this morning, we just pray that as we share together, that will each one of us be encouraged as we share in this time. Let's pray. Father, in this time of remembrance, we just thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made for each one of us. And we just pray that it will be a very special time as we focus on that. Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth and he revealed your glory. He revealed your love for mankind, a love so great that he would offer himself there as the perfect sacrifice that's made for each one of us. So, Father, as we share in this time together, we just pray for your continued blessing on us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the help has come forward, please. As we think of the juice of the vine, the symbol of the blood of Jesus that was shed for each one of us, let's drink together as we remember. Father, we just thank you for the power there is in the blood of Jesus Christ, the power to cleanse, the power to heal, the power to restore. And Father, we just thank you that you've sort of possible for that to happen right from the beginning of time was your plan that mankind could have that opportunity to be restored in relationship with you. So Father we just pray for your people around the world as they gather today that your name will be lifted high and Jesus will be glorified. Amen. Before Daryl comes to bring the message, we're going to stand and sing if we would like to. What a wonderful change of oh, rejoice, rejoice, our King is coming and the day will not be long.
good morning everyone. It's so good to see you this morning and thank you all for being here. It's good to have a friend of mine, Paul Henslin, with me this morning. You may recognise the last name. Uh, Paul is a grandson of the Henslins. There's a road named after them here and they've even got the old farms up off Boya Road there. So welcome Paul, good to have you with us this morning. Now let's just ask God to bless our time together as we open up his word. Father, we thank you for the joy of being able to open up your word and to proclaim the truth that you have for us there. We thank you, Father, that you have given us hearts and minds that can be tuned into you. And we pray that you would open them up this morning, that we might listen closely, that we might understand that your Holy Spirit speaking to us, and that, Father, we have a message that you want us to take from this place this morning and enable others to see our lives reflecting Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. When I was a, uh, a little boy, my parents had a number of different businesses. A couple of those were fruit markets and milk bars, and uh, most times the store was on the front of the house. And so mum would always cook the meals for us, and she would go into the shop and she would get whatever she wanted. And on numerous occasions, she would always cook uh, pumpkin for us in one way or another. But I never liked pumpkin, really disliked pumpkin, and so I wouldn't eat it. But my father would make us sit at the table until we ate the pumpkin. And so after a long time sitting there, we kind of ate the pum pumpkin, pushed it down, it kind of gagged us on the way down because it wasn't hot, and so it was really lukewarm. And after a while, I got to thinking, well, this is only doing myself damage. Maybe I better get to like pumpkin a little more. But as I was thinking about that in preparation for this message this morning, it took me to the book of Revelation. And when John there is recording the stories that the angel is saying to him about the seven churches in that area, he said something very significant to the church at Laodicea. And it's found in the third chapter of the book of the Revelation and it's recorded there in verse 16. Or we could go to verse 15. I know your deeds that you neither are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The reason that I went to that verse of scripture is because it reminded me of what I see so much around the world today. It's what it, I see when I go and sit in different churches around the world. I see people who are lukewarm in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us to think about that today. I want us to be really tuned in to where God wants us to be with a message that talks about us being lukewarm. God says he will spit us out of his mouth if we are lukewarm. And as I was dwelling on that verse of scripture, I thought to myself, well, why is it that you and I become lukewarm in our relationship with the Father? And I went back to the chapter before, to chapter 2. And there recorded in the first couple of verses is the reason that I believe that we together become lukewarm in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says to the church at Ephesus, he says, you have wandered away from your first love. You have wandered away away from your first love. You see, today it is easy for us to be involved in church but not really having a heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's easy for us to be socially oriented and aligned with people in the fellowship of the church but not to be on fire for the Lord. In this particular passage of scripture, God says to us, the reason that you are uh, cold in your relationship is simply because of the wealth that surrounds us. And you see, it's quite easy for us to accept that we have wealth, 
that we have all the goods that we need, that we live lives that are very comfortable lives. And so in a sense, we don't need God in our relationship. And as a result, we just go through the movements of being what a Christian ought to be. We live in a day and age where the church is being pounded on all sides, more so in recent months than what it has for a long time. Each week, Martin puts something in the local newsletter for us about suffering and persecution that Christians are going through all around the world. And you and I, to some extent, face a similar persecution, maybe not to the extent of some people in the world, but we certainly are facing persecution as men and women of God. And so this morning, I wanted to help us to understand why it is that we have wandered away from a really deep and personal relationship with God. And so I've chosen a passage of scripture that I've preached on before here, and uh, if you recognise anything of the similarities, then you'll have to excuse me, but I'm going to repeat myself in a couple of things today. The passage of scripture that I would love you to look up in your Bible and I know you all have them with you because I can hear the rustle of paper. It's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I want us to take a closer look at these two verses of Scripture. They are verses that you probably well know. They're verses that maybe you have repeated many, many times. But I want us to look at what these verses mean for us in this day and age when we experience maybe a lukewarmness in our relationship with God and our desire to share the message with the world at large. Paul here in this book of Romans is teaching very, very uh, foundational truths for the Christian life. So if you want to know how to live out your Christian life, if you want to be strong in your faith for the Lord Jesus, then this book is the book that you could go and you could study it for many, many years if you really wanted to. But in verse 12, uh, chapter 12 rather, and verse 1, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Paul says that there are things that God has promised us, there are things that God has done for us, that we should see as his mercy poured out upon our life. The record of those mercies that Paul is talking about is recorded in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. I want to list just some of them for you this morning. There's the fact that we have been justified from the guilt and the penalty of sin. When we become a Christian, God forgives us, he cleanses us, and he puts our sin as far as the east is from the west. He places them into the depth of the deepest part of the sea. God remembers our sin no more forever. <coughs> and so we no longer have the guilt and the penalty of sin. Joy, if we fail God, we need to seek his forgiveness and his cleansing as we go through. But we're also adopted in Jesus. We are the children of God, the adopted children of God. We are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. What an honour that is, the royalty that we hold. We are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ, who is our King, our Lord. And one day we will dwell with God in that wonderful heavenly home. We are given the Holy Spirit of God to live within our lives, Paul talks about that in the sixth chapter. He says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit comes and dwells within us. He lives within, he guides us, he directs us, he instructs us in the way in which God wants us to read his word, to apply it to our lives, and then live it out on a day-to-day -day basis. We are promised the gift of eternal life. If you can remember Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God 
is eternal life. We are forgiven. And when we are forgiven, God promises that we will have eternal life. We will be with him in eternity. It, one of the other mercies is that God promises to help us through our suffering and affliction. I don't know whether you've ever experienced it, but I know that I have. There have been times in my life where things have been so big, so large, they've weighed me down. And I don't know how to approach God with some of those issues. But in Romans chapter 8, God says that the Holy Spirit will interpret to me those deep yearnings that are within your very being. So God is able to help us through those times of suffering and affliction. God promises that he will be faithful to us every day of our lives. They are some of the mercies that Paul is referring to there. And if you want to understand them fully, go and search through those 11 chapters. Draw out the promises that God gives to us to help us to live out our daily life. But then Paul goes on in this 12th chapter of Romans. He says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices were laid on the altar and they were after they had been killed. But in New Testament teaching, God says, I don't want you to lay on the altar like those animals. I want you to be living. I want you to be demonstrating to those around you what it's like to be a living sacrifice. One that is holy and acceptable to me. To understand this a little more clearly, I was reading through the Old Testament and I was going in the book of Daniel. And there in chapter 3, I read the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And in that particular story, they had stood strongly against King Nebuchadnezzar. And as a result of that, King Nebuchadnezzar was so angry with them for not bowing down and worshipping this statue of himself that he had made, that he ordered that they be thrown into the fur furnace and that it be heated seven times to its normal heat. And so they were thrown into this furnace. When Nebuchadnezzar looked in that furnace, he said, didn't we just throw three people in there? They said, yes. He said, I see a fourth, and it's like the Son of God. And so King Nebuchadnezzar called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of that fiery furnace. They couldn't even smell smoke on them. Their clothes were not burnt. The Bible says that they're even wearing caps when they were put into the furnace. And when they came out, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, said these words as they are recorded here in verse 28 of chapter 3 of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Did you catch what Nebuchadnezzar said? He said they yielded up their own bodies. They presented themselves as living sacrifices to God because they believed in the truth of God's word, that he would protect them, that he would guide them throughout life. And that's what God's asking of you and I. He wants us to be people who are prepared to lay our lives on the line. But Paul goes on in that passage in Romans chapter 12, and I think he says something that's very interesting. He says there, that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, for this is your spiritual service of worship. Paul put in place 
the rightful process of us being in a right relationship with God. We need to acknowledge who God is and we need to worship him. And when we worship God, we do so with our whole body. But our body is made up with different components. Our eyes, God says, be careful where you look. Be careful what you do with your eyes. Your ears, be careful what you hear with your ears. With your hands, be careful what you touch with your hands because these are part of your body and they're part of your sacrifice to God. It's a sacrifice of worship. We don't just give our body as a whole, we give our component parts that often can be led into lustful thinking or lustful looking. And God says, be careful what you do with the living body that you are giving to me. And so Paul goes on in chapter 2, and he says, do not be conformed, do not be conformed to this world. What does he mean? He says, there is a culture out there that will destroy you. There is a culture out there that will drag you down. There is a culture out there that people want you to follow and will push you to follow a culture that is unhealthy for your style of living if you're in a relationship with God. And I want you to talk I want to talk about that and show you part of what Paul is talking about. If you go over to Galatians, the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse, uh, verse 19. Paul here outlines very clearly, and you can see it on the screen in front of you there. He says, the deeds of the flesh, and this is the culture, the earthly culture, culture that we are a part of. This is the culture that Paul says, do not be conformed to. He says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, Immorality, impurity, sensuality. Those three concentrate on sensuality, on sexuality. And we have to be so careful in this world today, we can throw our bodies away. We can surrender our bodies to whoever comes along and shows us a bit of love and affection. But God says, be very, very careful. There are a number of things that I just want to highlight. I see in the world today a great preponderance for people to be involved in adulterous relationships, where people who are married find another person that they want to share a physical relationship with. God is talking about that in this passage of Scripture. The other section of that is, and this disturbs me greatly, particularly for young people today. There are so many young people who don't think there is anything wrong with bedding down with someone before they are in a marriage relationship. God speaks about that as being fornication. It is physical relationship that is not in its proper perspective in the eyes of God. And there's those areas where sensuality or sexuality covers so much where there are people who are living in relationships with similar sexual partners, male and female. God speaks solidly against those things. But then he goes on and he says, there's such things as idolatry. That's putting anything before God. It could be a family. It could very well be uh, the fact that your home is the thing that you put a lot of pressure in or pleasure. Anything that comes before God is classified as adulterous. Sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. God labels them all. Disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, 
and things like these I've, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's very clear, isn't it? Paul says, don't be conformed to this culture. And to the church at Galatia, he outlines what they are. And he makes them very clear for people to understand. And so we're not to be conformed to this world. I would love for each of us to read those things when we go home, to think about them, to pray them through, to understand, to ask ourselves, am I guilty of any of these things? And be honest before God, because God knows the depths of our heart. But then he continues on, the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, and he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. God doesn't want us to be conformed to a lifestyle that doesn't meet up to his standard. He wants us to be transformed people. He wants us to be people who know what it is to live a life that is pleasing to God, that's directed by God, and that will give to us great personal satisfaction so that we don't have to struggle with life as so many people do in this day and age. But God says we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I have spoken to you before about neuroplasticity, but it's a study that's been done over the last 30 years towards the difference between the mind and the brain. The brain is that which tends to activate immediately something happens in our relationship. But the mind is what they call the advocate. The mind gives us thoughts that says, no, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't have done that. That's not the right thing to do. The mind acts as the advocate for the brain, the thing that kind of explodes with anger or with some comment to people when they have said something to us. But God knew that the mind was a very important part of our growing in our understanding and awareness of our relationship with God. Jesus, when he was on earth, spoke to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. And he said these words to them, and uh, I just found this really, really interesting. It's found in the Gospel of John, and verse 37, and it's up on the board for you. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this Jesus spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus spoke this before he ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit couldn't come until Jesus had ascended. But Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, then you will have rivers of living water flowing from your innermost being. It will fill your heart and your mind. Jesus knew the value of the mind to control our lifestyles. And so today, you and I are the recipients of the Holy Spirit living within us. Paul tells us that in the book of Romans. He says in chapter 6, he says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so as you sit there, as you contemplate your own walk with the Lord, recognize that God said from within you would flow these rivers of living water from your innermost being that would fill your heart and your mind, what with? The power and the love 
of God. Isn't that just a beautiful thought to have? It's an exciting part of our walk with the Lord to know that we have the power and the love of God available to us to live out our daily life as Christian men and women. And so as you contemplate these verses of Scripture, I want you to understand that the reason that so often we become cold in our relationship or lukewarm because we leave our first love is because we don't fully comprehend what it means to know the will of God. And Paul outlines that very clearly for us in this 12th book of the book of Romans because he finishes off that second verse and he says, by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove the will of God. We can prove the will of God. We can know the will of God when our lives are in that relationship with him that Paul speaks about. Recognising the mercies of God, becoming a living sacrifice, not being conformed to the culture and being transformed. When we follow that pattern of God, we will know his will and we will be able to move forward in great strength and power. And so let me just conclude this morning with this one uh, little passage found in the Gospel of John again, verse six, uh, chapter 6 rather, and uh, if we read verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, says Jesus, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord, then Jesus said, I will not lose you. I will still keep you. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who hold, beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on that day. Where are you in your relationship with God? Are you lukewarm? Have you lost your first love? Then Paul gives us the answer. And he says, follow the Lord by making your lives a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Maybe today God stirred within you a desire to kind of renew your relationship with God or to get right with God. Maybe you've never made a decision. I'm just going to offer a short prayer. And if you feel inclined, just stand where you are during the praying of that prayer. And I'll pray for you. Let's pray out together. Father, we thank you for the joy of knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord and Saviour. We thank you, Father, that it is so clear in your word what you want us to do with our lives. Anything short of that will always bring us heartache and pain. But, Father, when we are obedient unto you, we will know of your power, your love, your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Lead us faithfully on, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. To close our service, we're going to sing What a Wonderful Change My Life Has Been Wrought Since Jesus Came Into My Heart.
Father, as we move into this new week, we just pray that we go in your presence with your provision for us day by day. And whatever may happen, Father, may we just rejoice, because you are Almighty God. You are the one who is in control of all things. So continue to bless us and encourage us, we pray, now as we move forward. In Jesus' name, amen.